players gather to cast powerful spells, some of the oldest and most powerful in the history of Magic the Gathering. Wasteland, Aethervile, Goblin Lackey, and many others, battling head-to-head -head in brutal combat, they all have one thing in common, to uphold their legacy and the search for eternal glory. The Eternal Glory Podcast is brought to you by the minds behind Bosch and Roll on YouTube, Thraben University, and TheEpicStorm.com. This episode is sponsored by 3 for 1 Trading and Sparks Law Practice. Hello, and welcome to episode 124 of the Eternal Glory Podcast, Mind Goblin D's Bands. We've already recorded 30 minutes of introduction and banter for the week, available in our supporter-exclusive pre-show. Check out patreon.com slash eternalglory to gain access or join as a YouTube member for the same content on YouTube instead. As always, I'm Phil Gallagher, a.k.a. Thraben U. I'm Brian Koval, a.k.a. Bosch and Roll. And I'm Brian Cook of the Epic Storm. Shout out to our new Patreon subscribers since the last episode who enjoy the pre-show this week. We've got... Jack H, Dragon Day Dragon, Michael R, Zachary C, and Leon G. Shout out to all of you. Enjoy that pre-show. Someone's shirt may or may not have come off. Oh, that's what you're going to talk about? You're going to talk about that and not the phone charger underwear? Or the uh, home appliances bursting into flames? All of those happened in the pre-show this week. Pre-show was wild. This episode is brought to you by Sparks Law, a business transactional law firm owned by Eternal Magic community member Jonathan Sparks. If you're an entrepreneur, business owner, gig worker, looking to start your own company, Sparks Law can help you with partnership agreements, contract reviews, intellectual property protection, or any other business legal questions. If you want to shape your business strategy with a fellow eternal gamer, reach out via email to jsparks, that's J-S-P-A-R-K-S, at sparkslawpractice.com, or call 470-268-5234. This episode is also brought to you by 3 for 1 Trading, one of Europe's leading Magic the Gathering traders. Their online shop has a fantastic selection of high-end Magic cards, especially for vintage, legacy, and old-school players. You can find them at shop3 one tradingcom or visit their booth at major events. They run weekly sales, and new, individually scanned high-end cards are added every Wednesday. Code Eternal Glory can get you our community exclusive offer of free worldwide shipping on your first order over $500, and you can experience their world class customer service and exact grading for yourself. And if you would like to advertise to over 10,000 Eternal gamers every single episode, reach out to us. We're always accepting new sponsors. Okay, let's talk about the big thing that happened this week. There was a ban list update. We're going to start with this and then finish the mailbag from last week. That's the plan. And there were some surprise bans in Legacy, and I was not expecting any ban. And if I, there was a ban, it wasn't this. They banned all cards that make stickers or attractions in sanctioned formats, which primarily means Mind Goblin, Guacamole Goblin, Name Sticker Goblin is banned for practical purposes, and then some other fringe silly stuff. Yeah, I, I think everyone expected nothing or if we got something maybe it was grief or bowmasters but i i was purely of the opinion that nothing happens until modern horizon 3 comes out and this this caught me fully off guard well in the last bnr update they made note at the bottom that they were looking at a fix for stickers in legacy so they said to stay tuned for that i didn't know if it would be a part of the mh3 you know announcement or whatever but i mean I wasn't terribly surprised, and honestly, I think it's a positive change. People not having to worry about providing sticker decks or the secret game of like, oh, do I present a sticker deck even if I'm not playing one? All of that garbage is right out the door. I like a cleaner Magic the Gathering. Yeah, and, and that's what this ban was about. They made no mention of like goblins is oppressive to non-blue decks. Like it's like because that's just not even true. I thought goblins was good and healthy and a cool thing to have in the format. And even with the Mind Goblin around, uh, Ancient Tomb Mountain Gamers were still split between Red Stompy or Goblin Turbo Muxus. Like both are top 10 decks in Legacy right now, or they were until now. And 
I know a lot of people really like Turbo Goblins. That's actually my backup deck that I've built. I have it fully sleeved in my closet. That's my deck that I hand to people who need a deck to play Legacy. And it's just gone all of a sudden. And they must have been really worried about the logistics of this because I have played with stickers and paper. I don't know about you guys. You can weigh in in a second, but I have actually played with and against actual stickers and paper. And like, it's fine. It is not a big deal to do that. And the like top of my frustration was I played against one person who didn't write down the vowels. Like you can just, you know, on the sleeve, write like four five, six under each word. And I played against one person who did not actually know and had to count each one every time a sticker was revealed. Like that was frustrating to me, not the actual mechanic itself. I haven't played against attractions. I, I don't know what that's like. So uh, do you guys have thoughts? Have you experienced this? I have played against a lot of sticker people at, at Eternal Weekend or SCGs or whatever. I, like you, really liked when people wrote down the numbers, but I had a couple people that did not, and I was also just like, tell me how many that has or else I'm going to count them, and they would just tell me. Maybe I'm a little too trusting, but a difference is that on Magic Online, the experience was completely different. You could roll multiple sixes where in paper, you might never reveal a six, or if you do, you only get one. And then on top of that, if you're playing things like Phantasmal Image, and if you didn't register a sticker deck, all of a sudden you don't have the ability to make stickers, which is really awkward. So there was a difference between paper and Magic Online. Magic Online couldn't seem to code the stickers into the system, which was a problem, I guess, because it was just different. And I'd rather us have a closer experience between paper and Magic Online, which is part of why I don't like the announcement that they did with the last um, Universes Beyond set. Like, they should be the same. We shouldn't have separate experiences all the time. So anything that makes it closer, I'm just for. Yeah, I, I think that the clone and reanimate aspect of it, where I experienced zero people in the time stickers were legal who presented a sticker deck without the intent of actually putting them on cards. Uh, that never came up in practice, but sometimes you want to like reanimate a name sticker goblin for a burst of mana to do something else with in your scam deck. And you just can't do that if you didn't bring a sticker deck. So I think that is actually bad. Uh, but yeah, everything you said about they literally can't implement this on Magic Online. They had to do a workaround that is similar, but not the same. And, you know, if it's that like if the engine is broken, not the cards, like if the engine's that broken, then maybe this is for the best, even though it is going to hurt some folks. So when we got that initial teaser of like, we're working on something for stickers, we'll figure that out. I thought that was going to mean like some sort of MTR update where it's like, if you require a sticker deck for reanimating or a cloning and opposing effect, you may use your opponent's sticker decks or you may use this default sticker deck or something like that. I was expecting something like that, not the sweeping changes that we got. Yep, definitely. Th that was probably something that they worked on a lot. And then they were just like, is this juice worth the squeeze? Let's get them out of here. So, uh, I mean, it, it's kind of me, me to say this, but I mean, 56 cards got banned from Legacy yesterday, which is kind of crazy. That's never happened before. Yeah. And at the same time, it's basically only banning one card uh, with a small hat tip to some of the crazy brewers out there, like maybe PVDH who have been messing around with uh, what is it? The the most dangerous gamer and the other like black things that you can technically shove into a Nick fit deck or whatever, or a pox deck. Yeah. I feel for PVDH. Uh, he tweeted uh, the table of contents to a document he was working on explaining how all the infinity mechanics work and where you might want to play them and stuff. He's like, yeah, this is half written. Not going to finish it now. Tough beats. Okay. Let's quickly talk about what decks lose here. Wait, before we get into this, did either one of you happen to see the tweet from Mark Rosewater about how players just did not want to play with the uncards in their decks and how Rule Zero isn't applicable to the larger Magic the Gathering community? Yeah, obviously. I thought that was actually a, a huge tweet and saying like, hey, the Rules Committee is a small like fraction of the Commander people, but also like people in general just don't like the unsets in their game. I think that was really telling because we're probably not going to get more unsets entering legacy. And I mean, for every cool card you get like paradise lost, like there are some cards like sticker goblins. So there's a trade off, but I mean, paradise lost also could have just been a card in a regular set. Right. Yeah. And 
not to spend too long on this or uh, feel too cynical about it, because I think they did try to make the set appealing to the most people to the best of their ability. The sales of Unfinity were driven by the fact that half the set is tournament legal. That was a selling point. And now it is like two years later or whatever, uh, three years later. Wait, how long? I'm thinking of Unstable. No, Unfinity was much more recent. Okay. Uh, I was thinking about opening Unfinity packs in my old apartment, but it was not that set. Uh, yeah, the, the two years or so, whatever. They've just like, you know what? The thing we sold the set on, LOL, nah. But I think another important Mark Rosewater thing that happened on social media many years ago was, I think it was around Companions. And he was basically like, do you want us to sometimes push too hard and need to ban something? Or do you want us to never push? And I think pushing is better for magic. So whatever. Uh, nobody was buying Infinity boxes anymore and got hoodwinked recently. Uh, if you if you bought in, you had your time to play the cards. On a slight tangent, uh, the the popper banning that happened at the same time of all that glitters, that article also says like, hey, there's a card from Modern Horizons 3 that might need to be banned from popper. We know we're keeping an eye on it. We will act very quickly if that is the case. You know, when when they mess up, when they push something too hard for constructed purposes, like we can just like nip those things and take them out very quickly. Yeah, I had this in the notes to end the section, but since it came up, I'll just uh, read the thing. I'm going to be transparent here and provide a heads up that's a little unusual. And this is Gavin talking as someone who ha has been able to look at the comments from MH3. The rest of the pop performance panel does not see sets in advance. There's one comment from MH3 that is a high likelihood of needing to be banned in popper as it is like a card we have banned in the past. That's totally fine. And as always, magic sets shouldn't revolve around popper. They should do what each set lead decides is right choice for their set and the popper format will react accordingly. And that's really important for us and our audience because what he said about popper applies to all eternal formats. They are not balancing for legacy. They are not balancing for vintage. They are not balancing for CDH. They never have and they never will. They acknowledge that this might be a thing, and then they manage it with the ban list. And that is straight from the horse's mouth like yesterday, that that is still the current policy. And when people say stuff like, did they even think about Orcish Bowmasters when they printed that, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, that card's perfect for modern. It's annoying in Legacy, but perfect for modern, which is what they designed it for. And there it is, uh, again, a reminder to all of us in an article on the mothership that that's still the policy when designing for eternal formats is that they're not. All right. So how about we we talk about some some winners, some losers, some like practical changes that people might want to have in mind if they're doing any any deck building, if they're trying to select what deck they're going to play. I mean, the loser is obviously Turbo Mux's Goblin. Uh, that deck, uh, this this is not like losing Battlecry Goblin. This is losing the engine that made this deck hum. And I think this deck is just dead. We might see people still try to make big mana with like Skirk Prospect or something, but I think this is a lost cause. Yeah, I've I have played a lot of this deck. I, I think this deck is dead. I think you can still play a reasonable goblins deck, but it ends up probably looking very different. And the, the turbo aspect of it, I, I think, is gone. Yep, the turbo that goblins gets is back to lackey. Time is a circle and uh, Aether Vile and Wasteland are back for Goblins gamers. So it's worth noting that there are some Red Storm decks that played Sticker Goblin featuring the uh, Elemental Eruption card, and those decks took a hit because it was a guaranteed seething song. That I mean, not guaranteed, but you know, it could have possibly cast the Eruption on its own. So those decks take a hit and they likely go back to Jeska's Will, which they're not exactly the fastest decks, so Jeska's Will is often really sketchy. But that's the card that they'll go back to here. Yep. And then some decks, and they're pretty fringe, that were playing attraction cards, you know, your Nick Fitz, your weird pox decks or whatever. Uh, there's some Asper Blink type stuff with attractions running around out there. Um, that stuff obviously takes a hit. Yep. But as far as practical decks that aren't including sticker or attraction cards... I think some of these like Stifle, Phyrexian, Dreadnought, Doorkeeper, Thrall decks that really preyed on their ability to just like, oops, accidentally stop name sticker goblins and friends from doing their things. I think those decks take a little bit of a hit as they lose a very good matchup. 
Yep. And then the winners of the decks are slower fair decks that were pushed out of the format, like Initiative. Uh, unfortunately for Initiative, Rescaminator is also a horrendous matchup. So they had Rescaminator and Goblins in the top five decks of the format. Initiative went from a top three deck around Eternal Weekend six months ago to barely in the top 20 now by the numbers. And it's losing a natural predator here, but another predator is still the top of the format. So, you know, we'll see. I think a lot of the ancient tomb gamers are just going to take the low hanging fruit and switch to moon stompy decks of some kind. Like that is still a tier one ancient tomb deck that did not play name sticker goblin in the vast majority of its builds. And then the other winners are just people who had to dedicate a lot of slots to goblins. Uh, anyone who had force of despair in their sideboard. That card was not playable before Goblins became a deck, will not be playable again afterwards. But I, I seen it uh, between one and three copies in decks, and that's just gone. The omnipresence of Hydroblast in multiples in most control decks, that can chill out a little bit. Uh, so uh, those are those are big winners as well. Just freeing up your sideboard. They did mention that Orcish Bowmasters uh, was on watch and that Grief was on watch. Their last update article mentioned Orcish Bowmasters. This time they included Grief. So clearly they are keeping a pulse on Legacy. They know what people are talking about, but they still want to see what's coming with Modern Horizons 3 and how the format shifts and adjusts. Right. And they also mentioned Urza Saga and Luris in Vintage. And in the vintage blurb, I don't have the quote in front of me, but they said something like, we have to take community feelings into play, uh, even if the numbers don't seem that bad. So they are aware that people are rumbling and grumbling about Bowmasters and Grief, even if the numbers don't hold up. And there's definitely rumbling and bumbling about Saga and Luris in vintage as well. And both of those formats got the wait for MH3 treatment. There are, I mean, there's a big set coming. It's going to shake up Eternal Formats. And we'll see in a month or two what that really looks like, though. I don't know what answer they could print to grief. That would be some fringe development, creative nonsense, like <laughs> like a veil of summer that costs zero. If your opponent has to respell this turn, <laughs> I don't even know. It sounds like a mess. I don't think they're going to fix grief this way. Yeah, there was a Twitter post the other day. I forget who who said it, but it was basically along the lines of, yeah, OK, what are you supposed to do when you fight grief? You you don't force of will grief and if grief resolves and takes your answer to the grief, you know, takes the answer to the reanimate that's coming next, you know, it didn't matter that you had hate. And especially when you're on the draw, it can be hard to fight against. You know, I, I understand the the frustrations of grief and we'll see where we are in another month and a half. Amen. Any other thoughts about the ban update or can we do part two of this mailbag? No, I'm I'm excited, you know. I, I think a lot of people viewed that the time between now and the release of Modern Horizons 3 is just a lame duck format of like, we know the powerful stuff is coming. Now we're just waiting. And now at least we get like a little hiccup along the way to give us something to do for a few weeks. Yep. And the first two questions out of the mailbag are ban related. So we're not quite done yet, but we are into the mailbag. This is from Dragon Day Dragon. This is coming off the back of stickers getting the axe. Everyone is always talking about what they want to ban in Legacy, and mostly it seems like salty knee-jerk reactions to feels bad moments. I'm more interested in what cards would you would like to see unbanned. Personally, I wonder if Luris and Zerda are still broken with the three-man attacks, and I would love to see Oath of Druids come off the ban list. Thank you for always pumping out awesome content on the podcast and YouTube. First of all, thank you for the shout out to the podcast and our individual YouTube stuff. And no offense, but I would like to just say out into the world that Calling something a salty knee-jerk reaction to a feel-bad moment is going to hurt conversation if you're out there in the world trying to engage with people who, uh, you know, our thoughts on Orcish Bowmasters are that the card is balanceable and fine, appropriate for the format, but I know a lot of people don't feel that way, and I'm not going to have a good conversation with them if I come in with salty knee-jerk. So just, you know, cooling off the language before you answer the question. So do you guys have unbans you'd like to see in Legacy? So there's a weird balance when it comes to Legacy because so many cards are sort of shut down out of the gate due to being on the reserve list. And I feel like ne not, they necessarily shouldn't be because Legacy is already an expensive format. Over the pandemic, we saw dual lands hit $1,000 for like underground seas. And I would like it if people could play with cards that they love, even if they're expensive. Because, you know, uh, Tabernacle at one point was three grand. I don't know what it's at anymore. 
Uh, I doubt Survival of the Fittest will ever hit $3,000 per copy. So I think some cards like Survival should be unbanned Earthcraft. I think it's actually kind of a joke that Yawgmoth's Bargain is still banned. I, I think that card is truly unplayable. Uh, we saw when Mind's Desire was unbanned that it saw play for a couple weeks and then just quickly... It's like a fringe Burning Wish target, and I don't even play it myself as a Burning Wish gamer. So I would like to see more experimentation with unbans. Frantic Search, I think, would actually be fine. But Zerda and Luris, I kind of have opposite opinions on. I think that Zerda, with the decks that play it, actually don't care all that much about the three mana attacks, and then they just murder you. And I think Luris, it's oppressive in Vintage right now, still with the three mana attacks, so... I am open to it, but I think there is a real chance it would need to be rebanned. I like the idea that it means that there's friction in deck building where you can't play Murktide Regent and Luris. And things like that I enjoy, but I also think it's going to get really old once the format becomes solved and it's all just Luris decks. I think the problem with like focusing so much on unbans is unbans either do nothing or drastically alter the format in a way that's maybe negative. Like, you unban Zerda, and either that does nothing and the format doesn't change, and a couple of people can play some fringe combo deck that they like, or it is oppressive and scary, and now you still have that command companion hanging out in a zone that is relatively hard to interact with. I don't know that a lot of good comes from unbannings. I don't know that the format changes in a meaningfully good way. And some of the things that people think are fine on power level aren't going to make the format more fun. Like Mind Twist is a great example of that. Mind Twist is not a card that should be banned based on power level reasons. It's not that good. You know, it's worse than him to Turok in the early game. And it can do some disgusting things off a dark ritual sometimes. Cool. But it's not like most people sit down and they're like, oh, man, I got mind twisted last round. That was so fun. You know, Phil, I can in my head, I can imagine you. On screen, super giddy after you go turn one Dark Ritual, Dark Ritual, Mind Twist you. I can just picture you clapping your hands with glee. Oh, I'm a fucking sicko, and I would enjoy the ever-loving fuck out of Mind Twist. And then my opponent in chat is just going to be like, oh, fun game. I'm going to go play Yu-Gi-Oh. Well, like, the thing about Mind Twist, though, is Rit Rit Mind Twist, you're only up one card on your opponent, and you didn't get to pick what the cards were. Like, that's not even good. I think Mind Twist and Earthcraft can both come off the ban list like tomorrow and they would be fun for streamers to try, but neither one is going to break the format. Luris is Nutty Busto and should be banned even with the three man attacks. I don't know what it would take five, six man attacks before Luris is legacy. OK, like I, that card is just so stupid. If you play vintage at all, you know, if you played modern, it lasted longer than it should have been modern. I, I would play Luris immediately if it was legal and legacy. I never got to play the Zerda deck uh, that sort of broke out right at the end of the band cycle and they axed it before I got to play with it. But I'm not really worried about like Basalt Monolith turbo combo bomber decks, but I am worried about the deck that showed up at the end of that format. That was just like Planeswalker control where every permanent was a Planeswalker or a land that met Erda Zerda's thing. And then I just played four cards to go infinite. You just wish for a monolith out of your sideboard. I don't know. Maybe Zerda's. I'm more open to Zerda than Luris. I also think Oath is is not okay. If you've ever played Oath versus an opponent who has to win with creatures, you know what I'm talking about. If you thought Oko invalidated a huge swath of the metagame, Oath is so much worse than Oko. <laughs> it's not even close. Uh, so I appreciate the swing, but I think Oath, I think Survival, I think those are actually busted. It should not become unbanned for any reason, but Earthcraft is a a reserve list card that I think would be fine. All right. Our next question comes from Matthew S. Do you all feel WotC is too aggressive when banning cards in modern? From my perspective, it seems when Wizard bans a card from the most played deck, it simply causes a new best deck to rise to the top of the metagame. For example, they banned Fury when Rakdos Scam had the highest meta percentage, which held Rhinos in check. Then Rhinos became the next deck with the highest meta share, which led to Violent Outburst being banned. Now it feels as though Leyline of the Guild Pack will be banned any day now due to Domain Zoo having too high of a meta share. Do you all agree with the ban philosophy of Wizards, or are they playing whack-a-mole with the next strongest card in the format? I'll jump on this one first. First of all, there will always be a best deck in every format. That's just how it is. 
or at least a set of one or two or three top of the format obvious best decks. That doesn't mean they have to be banned. And meta share is not the same as win rate. Like everyone could decide to play Merfolk tomorrow. And that doesn't mean we need to ban Lord of Atlantis, like 70% meta share. That's crazy. But it's probably not beating most non mirror matches because the deck's not good. So Racto Scam needed a ban. It probably should have been Grief, not Fury or both. Uh, but it did receive a ban because the deck was out of line. And then Rhinos received a ban because it was out of line. When there is a deck that's out of line, keeping another deck that's out of line, sometimes it, it is whack-a-mole as we figure out the next order consequences of a ban. But when something like Delver of Secrets in Legacy or Death Shadow in Modern is at the top of the format, if the best deck is a deck that has to play creatures, attack and block, and play interactive spells to win the game, that's a good thing to balance around. And as long as it's not busted, like... We were just talking about Luris. Luris Shadow was too good. They banned Luris. Now Shadow is just a deck that's out there. Just figuring out what's wrong with the deck and what we should balance around is part of the format. And it's okay that a deck is the best deck. And something like Domain Zoo, a deck that has to attack and block and put creatures into play, cast spells. I think that's a fine thing to balance around. So I have had a lot of conversations with people who have the power to ban magic cards. I am, I am good friends with Alex Ullman. And sometimes he will say like, hey, what do you think about Popper right now? What would you ban? Why would you ban that? And I never get to know all the cool inside stuff that's going on. But like I, I, I talk and, you know, he'll be like, OK, if this happens, you know, how does that respond? How does that change things? And it's really hard to know exactly what is going to happen as a result of ripping something out of the format. And when you read these these articles that the Popper Format panel puts together or the, the, the video form that Gavin puts together, like you can see that they put a lot of thought into permutations of what could happen. So I think there is a lot more thought going on with some of these bands than is immediately apparent. You don't always get all of the details. And the Popper Format does the best job of giving you all the dirt. Like, here's what we did. Here's why we did it. And I think you just don't see a lot of that, or at least as much of that for the modern stuff, which maybe makes it feel frustrating. To piggyback on Phil for a second. So, Phil, you mentioned being able to predict the format. And, you know, that is a tough thing to do. Hey, if we ban this card, what is going to be the waterfall effect going downstream of, you know, all of these stacks? What's going to rise to the top? Is there going to be a natural predator for the top deck? All that sort of stuff. As Members of the community, we see that during spoiler season sometimes. It's a very similar thing. You're having new cards added. I remember when all that gl was gl all that glitters was uh, revealed out of that commander deck uh, for one of those sets. And people are like, oh, this is awesome. It's a common. Think about Bogles and Pauper. For two or three days, all I saw were Bogles comments. And then the, like that Saturday, the deck lists were published from the challenge. And the top one of the top decks was just Affinity with all that glitters in it. And I was like, oh, it says Artifact. Like, it took me a few days. But, like, nobody was talking about Affinity with all that glitters. They were all talk talking about how Bogles was going to be a best deck. Where Bogles ended up, like, not really gaining any popularity. Where one of the top three decks in the format just got better. And most of the Magic community just swung and missed on that one. So... If you're someone making the changes, sometimes you're going to swing and miss. Sometimes you're going to be, think, oh, I think Fury's the card that needs to go. And we'll see how the format adjusts. And if, you know, Crashing Fall Falls is a card we have to come back to later, so be it. I think that's a fine philosophy to have. And the whole whack-a-mole thing isn't anything new with bands. It's been that way for the, since the dawn of time. Yep. And like I started with, the important thing is not popularity or that a deck is best it's is it out of line on the data for win rates is it unbeatable through fair means or do people just need to adjust their deck from before this deck was popular to now beat it i also want to make a small correction because i think alex will be horrified if we say he can ban cards on the podcast he is part of a group who can recommend things to gavin who can then recommend things to wizards it other people at wizards and then maybe things get banned <laughs> so okay yeah no that was a, that was a gross oversimplification of a chain of command there okay next question is from kafraz 
As a person like myself who has played a lot of CEDH and Casual Commander and is now jumping over to Legacy due to my LGS now running Legacy, based by the way, love that, what bad habits should I look out for or is the mindset and play patterns closer than I realize? I'm going to jump in on this right away because this is becoming a lot in my coaching. I coach a lot of CEDH players on CEDH and I coach a lot of CEDH players who are learning Legacy and I coach a lot of limited players who are learning Legacy. and. A thing that keeps coming up is how to spend mana and in limited, especially the way sets are designed now, it's essential to be like spending mana, like one drop, two drop, three drop, and then two two drops or a four drop on turn four. And you're falling a lot behind if you're not really using your mana in commander. If you pass through a turn cycle to play around one person's counter magic, you expect two other people are doing stuff and that mana disappearing unused might come back to bite you like if you just hold up bow masters because you know someone has wheel of fortune and then they just don't cast wheel and the two other players develop their boards while you two stare at each other you're both falling behind and that's mana that went to waste for two of the four people in 1v1 constructed especially legacy if you know your opponent has something like days or spell pierce but they're not adding to their board you don't have to spend mana you don't have to cast spells into a days or a spell pierce you can wait you can wait until you have an extra land to pay for days or two extra lands to pay for spell peers or three extra to pay for both. If they are not clocking you and building up their own resources and playing their own game, you don't have to play into their game. Take them off their game. It's not about spending all of your mana every turn in these formats. And th that's been something that has come up with probably six to ten recent coaching clients in like the last couple months that really is stark when you move into this space. I'm going to say something a little bit different here, and it's that if you're learning legacy, don't be afraid to ask your opponent questions. Like maybe don't ask them things mid game, but after the match be like, hey, I'm pretty new. I was thinking about this or this play. Do you mind, you know, giving me your feedback, things like that. I found that a lot of the legacy community are happy to have new members join just because like we're, you know, we're dwindling a little bit and a lot of them are, you know, eager to help out. So don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, we're a pretty nice group. I, I think especially if you are shifting from the casual table to the competitive table, Sitting down and making sure you understand what it means to be in a competitive event is, I think, really important. I recently played in a CEDH tournament where one of the people that I played against did not understand the difference between casual REL and competitive REL. Like, that was not a concept that they understood, and they got, like, four judge calls in a, in a single game. Like, it was just a disaster for them, and they just physically did not understand what it meant to be in a competitive event and like how they had to behave differently and play differently. And I think making sure you have the the general knowledge of what is going to happen, what penalties are like, what things you can miss, what things you can't miss, all that sort of stuff. I think you will have a much better time if you take a few minutes to learn that stuff. Yeah, that's a great take. Coming from CEDH, like official tournament money on the line play, you might have a taste of that already. If your experience with CEDH is spell table games, you might not have experienced this at all. A uh, great shout, Phil. Make sure you read the Magic Tournament Rules and the Infraction Procedure Guide. These documents are available on the internet. That, that's what judges use to make events work, and you need to know that too, so you can work within the event. Also, you need to know when the judge is wrong. Judges are great. They usually know what they're talking about. But occasionally, they are going to give a wrong ruling. And if you know your stuff, you know when you need to appeal, and you can get the correct ruling. This involves that same player. That player in question was about to immediately receive a match loss. And I went, Judge, I don't think that's how that works. I believe this is supposed to be a turn skip. The judge looked at me, blinked. They had never heard of a time skip before. And they went, what? And I'm like, I'd like to appeal your ruling. <laughs> and I kept that player from kind of immediately being kicked out of that game. That player had no idea. I did, and I could not bear to just like let that player go and just like let that be their first tournament experience. I couldn't do it. For sure. All right, the next one is from Derek C. What sort of donor decks do you enjoy the most? Which do you dread? Do you enjoy challenges, brews, meta busters? Are you interested in me donating for another Phil versus Brian challenge, like with the Mycosynth Gardens brew challenge? To that last part, 
Always. Always yes. We love that sort of stuff. But let's field some of these things. Let's start with Bryant here. Because I know Bryant like actively turns down stuff, you know. He he won't play the Karn decks. Uh, I will play Karn decks. I'll just be miserable doing it. I think that people sometimes submit decks that they think are funny rather than competitive. And something about me is I like winning. Like in my in my inner core, I love to win. And when people submit things that are truly just awful because they think it's funny or fun. I don't enjoy those. Like, I remember there was a deck I received years ago that was a Sylvan, what's it called? Sylvan Library deck, where it played four Sylvan Libraries, four Tendrils of Agony. It had Rift Bolt in it and, like, Dark Rituals and Rite of Flames. They're like, yeah, it's like a slow storm deck. You just draw, like, two extra cards every turn. You cast multiple Tendrils. You cast Rift Bolts. It's going to be bol- it's gonna be great. And I was just like, okay, uh, I guess I'm doing this. And that was one of the times where I realized that instead of me being miserable for $25, I can just tell the person no. Because, like, I'd rather not play something where I'm clearly not happy, the person's not going to be happy with the result, and I can save my play points. Like, it's a win-win if, like, I'm just honest with the person that I don't want to play their deck. I've also had some decks where I'm really skeptical, and then they end up being great. So, like, I am not always right, but knowing when to say no, I think, is pretty important. I think my favorite decks are the ones where it's clear that like someone has been working on this deck for months. Like it is their pet deck and they are ready to show it off to the world. And it ends up being far better than I expected. I'm blanking on who brewed it, but like there was a, what is the lightning ball elemental? Skelemental, like Rakdos deck a while back that I played. This was many years ago at this point, probably like three years ago. And like I played that deck and like I had a blast and I did relatively well while hitting people with like six one elementals. And it was like, oh, that went surprisingly well. Like, I am happy that I got to play your brew and it works. The ones that I dread playing are the ones that I know are bad and are going to have trouble winning, but they're pretty good at not losing. Like, when I sit down to record a jank pile and I know it's going to take four hours to record that league. There's, there's occasionally some suffering there, but I have turned down very few deck lists. Occasionally, I will get something that is like literally trying not to win the game, like they're trying to draw games of magic. I'll say no to those, but otherwise, I'm pretty open to taking stuff, and I enjoy the vast majority of what I play. A uh, quick amendment. So, Phil, and I know that you're in the same boat as me on this one, uh, infinite combos on Magic Online that require tons of clicks. I know that you're very anti-food chain, for example. Uh, There's a deck in Pauper called Familiars, where for every, like, 25 clicks you do, you gain, like, one mana and a card out of the graveyard. Because you have to, like, loop a certain number of things and bounce all these triggers, and it ends up taking a long time. I recorded a Grixis version of it once back when Galvanic Relay was legal, and I said never again. I timed out multiple times. It was just one of the worst experiences of my life, and I know that you just happen to share a similar view on that. It's gotten a little better since I changed how I do my recording, and now I just cut out a lot of stuff that is not fun for the audience. So it used to be like while I was streaming in particular, like if I was streaming something like Allurin, like, that was just miserable as I, like, sit there quietly clicking through the combo, making sure I don't miss mess stuff up. Like, that that was a little annoying to do. And now, a lot of times, like, if I'm executing a combo, I'll be like, okay, and now that you've seen one loop, I'll just, like, pause my recording and, oh, and now it's done and we win. GG. And I can do it without making it suck for my audience. Yep. I'm going to just co-sign a lot of what you guys said. I enjoy decks that are surprisingly coherent like nobody else is trying this but the deck is good like good chance we four one with this once we see how it's moving and i don't mind saying no to things that are clearly bad uh my uh don't deck donation has two tiers which is like ready to go decks cost one thing and then i have to put a bunch of work into this costs more and i will assess a list and tell you whether it's a or b and what it's going to cost to be on the channel uh, like before we uh, lock anything in. What I dread is when I miss. When I see, see something and I'm like, yeah, this makes sense on paper. Or uh, even at the higher tier, like, yes, I could brew around this. Recently, Pursuit of Knowledge came through my brew challenge. This is three and a white for an enchantment. 
and you can skip a draw to put a counter on it and you can remove three counters to draw seven. And I was like, okay, yeah, I, I see the bones here, like one Sylvan library activation, one brainstorm, and we're just drawing seven. I can brew around this. And then I tried. You cannot brew around that card. You have to spend four mana in Legacy to get a card into play. That's one. If you brainstorm into this, that's a card. You have to put two cards back still, even if you skip the draw. That's two more. So you're five cards in and five mana to be plus two cards. It's just the worst divination you've ever seen. Uh, I ended up having to circle back and be like, hey, I'm really sorry. I can't actually build this deck. And that's happened like two or three times where I bite off more than I could chew or I take on a deck that's worse than it seems at the the ready to go level. And then I end up putting the extra money's worth of work into it just to make it playable. That's what I dread the most. I recently tried to build a scry deck like a, a donor submitted a blue green scry deck. And I'm like, yeah, I can probably make that work. And I spent a lot more time than I care to admit trying to tune that deck into something that could put up some wins. And it was still it was still brutal. So like sometimes you put in the work, you put in the effort, you fix a bunch of problems with the deck and then the deck still ends up having too many problems to be playable. But a lot of times you don't know until you try. You don't know until you're two rounds into the league and you go, oh, shit, I needed I needed something else here. But you're committed at that point. All right, we have six questions left and 16 minutes left in the pod. So let's keep this thing moving. Next question is from the Tony Scaponi. What do you think about a format without days? And do you think banning days is potentially a better solution than having to ban some number of cards every year? How many new printings must die for days of sins? Tony, we need days to keep mad men like you in control. (laughs) Like, honestly, like if you go back two years on the pod, you'll find full episodes about us being like, yeah, Renin Six is gone. Dreadhorde Arcanist is gone. Deathrite Shaman is gone. All of these can be traced back to days. We thought this at one point too, and I've come all the way around. I don't think that that is good. I, I don't think that days leaving the format makes sense. I, I think that it's one of the things that defines the legacy rules of engagement, and just more things to shove, uh, more things to stop shoving, because the. The format can shove, obviously. You're Tony Scaponi. You know about shoving, uh, like One Rings, Paradox Engines, whatever it is, ad nauseums. Like, and I'm not saying we need to keep combo in check, but even just like to Fairy Time Raveler, I'd like to daze that. And daze, it exists in this nice little spot where if you have the luxury of playing around it, your opponent is stuck with a dead card in their hand. And if you don't have the luxury of playing around it, something probably went wrong in the game or your opponent played well to keep days relevant for longer. I don't know. I I am pro days at this point in life, even though I personally hate playing with and against the card, but I think it is good for legacy. In one of the BNR updates, they also said that days was one of the, uh, a part of one of the pillars of legacy. They specifically called it out along with wasteland and brainstorm. I don't think that they're even considering days. I mean, you could, you know, pitch the argument or whatever, but I less than 1%. That's what I'm going to say here. Yeah, there have been times in the past where I have been frustrated with days, but most of the times where I think days seriously comes up in band conversation is because something else is very broken and days is pushing that broken thing further. Right. Days needs to be protecting something that is worth going back a land your land drop is one of the most precious and gated resources in Magic the Gathering. And for you to pick up a land to stop your opponent's spell, especially if it's a powerful proactive, like if you're dazing a removal spell to protect a creature like Dreadhorde Arcanist, that's Dreadhorde Arcanist's problem, not daze. Okay, next question from Jared B. Love your popper content. Have you been liking where the format is? Bryant, have you tried Jund Dredge? No, I have not tried Jund Dredge, but if you want to submit it as a donation deck, I am here. I am willing to play that deck. I actually recorded Popper Cycle Storm last week. It's probably my second favorite deck after the Epic Storm. Absolutely loved it. The League was a lot of fun, although I never once faced Red or all that glitter. So, you know, that was certainly a bonus. But Popper is a great format. It's top three formats for me, even, you know, despite the bannings over the last few years. I think it's just a great play experience. Yep. I also love Popper. I love it more that all that glitters is gone. And that's how I feel about that. I have no thoughts on Popper at this time. I'll record a league in the next week or two. 
We'll report back. No thoughts. Head empty. That's Phil. Okay, next question from Doll. What is the current best build of Pox? My legacy deck has different art for every single card. I have found this drives certain people crazy. What type of person are you in regards to this? All right, let, let's start with Pox because I think that's easier. Phil, do you have thoughts on Pox? Yes. Don't play Pox. Play something with Grief, Reanimate, Troll of Khazad Doom, and a bunch of aggressive black creatures. The best build of Pox doesn't have Pox. It does not have small Pox. It just plays the good black cards and gets your opponent dead. Well, that answer is cheating. Uh, the best build of Pox has Bowmaster in it. It's just like a powerful card that you could play on its own merits. And then it also provides you material. Most of the problem with like hate bears and cool creatures you'd like in a prison deck is that they die to your Poxes. And Bowmaster just solves all that. I like Bowmaster in high numbers in Pox right now. Urza Saga, Change the Game, all of those things are how I actually feel about Pox. But Phil is also right if winning is your goal. But if winning with Pox is your goal, those are my pieces of advice. Yeah, if winning with Pox is your goal, put as many powerful cards that can win the game on your own into your Pox deck. You know, you know your Urza Sagas, your Orcus, Bo- Orcus Bowmasters, Grief reanimates, however much of that stuff you can fit in and make work, do it. And you need a lot of lands, like 27, 28, like a lot of lands, not 23, a lot. I have strong opinions on the second half of this question. Yeah, let's go. The different versions driving people crazy. It depends on what your goals are. Like they talked about previously with Pox, like if your goal is to have fun, sweet, do whatever you want. If you're trying to be competitive, alters, all these sorts of things, different versions, there are differences between the cards where if I'm a skilled player and I play a Thought Seizer or a Grief or Getaxian Probe, whatever, something that gives me information about your hand, you draw and then you play a different version of that card, I just gained information from you. That is a advantage that I now have because you're playing silly different versions of cards in your deck. And I've seen that bite multiple people in the butt. It also happens on Magic Online where somebody might have a rental service that gives them one Mercadian Mass Brainstorm and then all of a sudden they cast the one from Conspiracy and I'm like, oh, they still have Brainstorm in their hand. That is information that you don't need to give your opponent if you just have a coherent themed deck. Play to win, play the same versions of cards. That's my opinion. Yeah, I agree with that. If your goal is to win, you should be hiding information. And even if you're like, no, it's fine. If they see my hand, I'll just track it. That's brain space you're using to track who saw what. I've told this story on the pod before, but many years ago during uh, Dragons of Tarkir standard, there was a dragon's deck and the dragon mechanic was if you control or reveal a dragon when you cast the spell, it gets some sort of bonus. And there was an entire Esper control deck built around this mechanic. And I borrowed a deck from a friend who liked having different versions of all the cards. And I cast the like counter spell on turn two that reveals a dragon. And I showed them a Dragon Lord Ojitai. And there were four different Dragon Lord Ojitais in this deck. And I forgot because I had borrowed the deck until I drew a second one. And then I was like, oh no, which one have they seen? And that just became a thing all day where I had to waste brain space thinking about like, oh, did they see the foil Russian one or the Portuguese one? or the pre-release art, pre-release foil one. Like that is actually a huge spew if you're trying to be competitive. And as far as driving people crazy, I don't like looking at decks that look like that. Uh, Like I said, multiple friends who do it. I think it's fine. It's your cards, whatever. I don't want to look at it. I wouldn't want to own that deck, but you're not getting any competitive edge. If I thought sees you and see like two different brainstorms, I'm not like, oh no, I've forgotten how to play magic now. I'm so tilted. Like whatever, just do what you want with your cards but understand that you are giving up some competitive edge by doing it, not gaining it. All right, the next one is from Terrence, who has a crazy idea. Fix the reserve list. Watsi should run Magicon booths that allow players to exchange any reserve list card for five, question mark, new versions of that card to increase the supply of cards essential for Legacy, Vintage, and CEDH tournaments. I believe that this would create affordable tournament legal cards without devaluing existing collections. While this wouldn't make Watsi money directly, keeping those formats playable without proxies would help sell more Eternal Masters too. Is this idea crazy, or am I actually a mega super genius? Okay, um, I want to dig in on this just a little bit to help people understand it, because I had to read it a few times to understand why this would make sense. And the idea is, even if your like Mox Jet went from, let's say, $3,000 to... $600. Now you have five of them and it's fine. 
like that's the trade-in uh where like the card's worth less but you personally get more of them to balance out the value of your collection i think that's the crux of this idea and here's the trick the people who want to play magic are not the people mad about the reserve list it's the people who have 600 mox jets in their storage unit or in their bank vault those are the people who would call lawyers if something happened and those people don't want any of this shit to happen so if we assume you know goodwill on behalf of everyone and we just want more players in the ecosystem maybe this makes some sense but for the people i mean even if this did happen i wouldn't want to trade my unlimited power for whatever this is uh, whatever new border thing they would not give me five copies of it, it's just I don't think this would work, and it, it is assuming that the people who are mad about the reserve list are coming from a place of good faith rather than uh, capitalist greed, which is just not the case. I've said this before in the past, but I think that they should just announce a date in which the reserve list will end, make it some number of years in the future, give people that are hoarding copies time to release them back into the public, and just say, hey, in 2030, the reserve list will be abolished. You have five years to get rid of your cards. And if you don't do it by then, you know, tough. Uh, give people time that have been sitting on a large amount of them their share to, you know, disperse them. But I think that's really the best way to do it. I don't see it ever happening, but I think the trade-in system, I, like Brian said, I would never trade in my FBB duels for reprints. Never. Yep. I think we're just kind of stuck with the reserve list. The only way we'll ever be out of it. There is no clever solution. The only thing wizards can do is decide to fight the legal battle and rip off the Band-Aid. And that is something that only uh, Wizards and Hasbro Legal can decide on. And there is no clever workaround like this one that will convince anyone that it's going to work. And I just want to highlight one sentence from this or one part of it. Quote, while this wouldn't make WotC money directly then why are they targeting resources towards doing this? And I, I think this is an, a part of the reserve list problem is like anything that WotC does to really touch that reserve list in a meaningful way probably results in a bunch of lawsuits, a bunch of unhappy people. In order for touching the reserve list in any way to make sense, it has to be something that is going to make them a lot of money and make it worth their time. And something like this that isn't going to be, be making them a lot of money probably isn't worth their time to address just from a business perspective. Yep. The closest thing we ever had was that brief window where we got like Phyrexian Negator, Mox Diamond, Survival of Fittest. We got a few reserve list cards reprinted in foil because there was the non-premium clause in the reserve list. And if that loophole hadn't been closed, then we could have gotten something like from the vault Demir and then like once a year. They put like Underground Sea in some limited edition, like something with horrendous foil that nobody even really wants to own, but it would put some out there. That's the closest we got. But I I heard a story from a story. Uh, so I'm a third hand party to this information. But I heard someone say that who worked at Wizards for a while that it was extremely intentional that they did Phyrexian Negator first just to see if they could slide a reserve list card through in a like widely printed product and make it available to people on, on a card that nobody even cares about and the answer was people were mad the people i was talking about who have twenty thousand phyrexian negators in a storage locker just waiting for that sweet sweet payout when they're ready to retire those people are paying attention and they are mad about any little thing so sorry as long as they're out there we're stuck we got two questions left this one is from Sir Stickbug. Congratulations on your knighthood, Mr. Stickbug. If Mr. Phil Gallagher himself could answer this one, that would be my dream. How does one beat control with an aggressive deck? The OTJ Store Championship is coming up, and my worst matchup at the moment is blue-white control, and I am on red-green prowess. Any tips for that matchup that seem to be old as time itself? While this question is for Standard, a format you guys don't really play at the moment, I'm hoping that generic MTG heuristics will transfer from other formats. And I just want to shout out Sir Stickbug. We realized that the OTJ Store Championship is something that came up on the calendar. And this episode ended up being divided over basically four weeks. So we did message him already with an answer. But let's cover it for everyone else still. All right. I'm going to read the response that I wrote. At a fundamental level, I often find that I want to go under the control deck in game one. 
Your opponent often won't know what deck you are on until after mulligan decisions have been played out. And if you can press an early advantage, you may outspeed their removal or prevent them from establishing engines like up the beanstalk or other sources of card advantage like planeswalkers. In many formats, turn 4 is the turn where the control deck starts to gain access to powerful sweepers, Day of Judgment, Supreme Verdict, or other effects that start to swing the game hard in their favor. I want most of my damage to be done by then, and I want to limp over the finish line for the last couple of points of damage. In post-sideboard games, your opponent is going to have additional access to removal and early interaction, so the get them dead ASAP approach doesn't necessarily work as well. Instead, I'm often trying to present a card that my opponent can't beat. Stormbreath Dragon from Theros was a great example of that, as Protection from White invalidated most removal options, and Turok Dread Cantor is sometimes played in Legacy sideboards for the same reason. Cards with Hexproof, Shroud, or other built-in protection are great, as are cards that can repeatedly come back from the graveyard. Yep, that's all good stuff, and I want to add one thing to this as well. And that's put the control deck off balance. And this circles right back to that advice I gave for CDH players trying to start legacy. If you know what your opponent wants to do with their mana, if you know what their game plan is, you could put them off it. And this is something like if you're playing against blue white control and they have two mana up, which represents no more lies, which is a a standard legal mana leak for those of you who don't play standard, they would like to no more lies your play on turn two they would like to three steps ahead your play on turn three and then they would like to memory deluge to reload on turn four but if you just don't cast your spell on your turn three into their mana leak and then you just beat with what you have in play from turn one and two and then on turn four when they want a memory deluge play two cards now they either have to have double mana leak for that double no more lies or they can no more lies one of them and you get another one through. Or even if you don't have the ability to double spell, if they no more lies on your turn, they can't memory deluge because they don't have four mana. And that's what they want to be doing that turn. And just looking for little exchanges like that where you can make them play on your speed rather than just tapping out into the world's most obvious answers every turn. Like if they're holding up four mana for the Wandering Emperor, maybe just don't attack into that right away. Play your card pre-combat rather than post-combat to see if they're going to counter it or if they're going to leave up the four for the Wandering Emperor. Like those are all decisions that you can make as somebody with agency in the game. And our last one here comes from Adam. In an effort to cause some controversy, what format has the highest skill ceiling and why is it Legacy? There are a few formats, Vintage Cube, Dan Dan, CEDH, I have at the top, but I believe Legacy tends to have the most thought-provoking situations the most often. Would love to hear your thoughts. I think the most skill testing format is sealed deck because it is the sloppiest and you can say like, I had a bad sealed pool. I'm not playing today. But if you look at Grand Prix, I believe it was Boston in maybe 2008. This was one of the most busted sealed formats ever. It was one of the core sets that had Sarah Angel overrun sleep fireball and all of these insane cards at uncommon. And if you look at Ben Stark's top eight pool, He went, I think, 801 on day one, and he had zero of these cards. I think he played zero rares. He was beating a format full of Fireball, Sarah Angels, and Overruns with cards like Deadly Recluse and just like Creature Combat and Giant Growth. And that is a sign to me that he was on some other shit that other people didn't even know about. Uh, I know I I attended that event, and one of my friends did fail to make day two with a Sarah Angel and two Fireballs in his sealed pool. Meanwhile, Ben Stark is killing people with Deadly Recluse. So... I think there is some deep wizardry in sealed deck because it tests not only the ability to play well and get the most out of every card, but you have to build well and get the most out of every card in deck building. Then you have to play each of the cards to the max. And I think sealed deck and and draft uh, draft is a different skill set that is also highly skill testing because then you have to draft, then build, then play. But uh, I think sealed deck and limited are probably actually the highest skill formats. Legacy has a lot of built-in safety valves, and what I mean by that is there's cards that create consistency. You have Pondria, Brainstorm. If you're playing a combo deck, you have Echo of Aeons to fix mulligans where some of the outlandish cards in your deck being in your opening hand cause you to mulligan. I'm talking about things like Guy's Well, for example. And it has these fixes in there, 
And when I'm playing Modern and I draw double Lotus Field, I'm reminded constantly about there not being a Brainstorm or even Faithless Looting to fix the quality of my hand because I'm being punished for the bad cards that I'm playing. And having those built into Legacy doesn't necessarily make it more thought-provoking. I think there's a skill that is not talked about enough, which is just being really good with limited resources, which goes back to what Brian was saying about skilled deck, where you might have a really bad pool or something, but being able to know how to get the most out of what you have is incredible. And I feel like that's why a lot of limited players have a much easier time transferring over to 60 card formats than the other way around, because limited players have a much better understanding for the game itself. And I know that like we all love Legacy, it's why we're here, but I don't think Legacy is nearly as complicated as some people make it out to be if you go back to an article from a decade ago, like, the best brainstorm is the one you never cast. Uh, I think that article is BS from the time it was written, uh, but people really bought into it. And, you know, don't sniff your own farts. That's all I have to say. I think it is very easy to look at all of the crazy scenarios that are possible in Legacy where the stack gets 10 spells deep and there are like some lines that you could spend an hour analyzing. But, you know, if I'm going to put my, my money on something, I, I think Limited is harder than Legacy and I don't think it's close. Like, imagine that like Limited is the primary format that you play. Like, you, you sit down, you build your pool, you now have to remember everything that's in your deck, in what numbers, you have to know what combat tricks your opponent can have, you have to not mix up this draft with the previous draft that you're playing, especially if you are like running the same thing uh, in like a multi-draft format or something. I think there is a lot of mental overhead where it's easy to miss how mentally taxing some of the things that you might be, be doing during sealed or drafts are. Like you will casually watch someone like LSV draft and be like, oh yeah, I wonder if I'm going to wheel X card in two packs from now when it was just like some random bullshit card that did not matter at all at the time, but then the evaluations changed. Like the people who are really, really good at limited have incredible memories in many cases. Yeah, there's this other thing, and I know we're trying to wrap the episode, but now I'm hyped about limited. There's another thing about draft being good at draft is that it resets every three months. Everything you knew is now warped through a different lens. And there's stuff that still holds up like, you know, evasion is good. Cantrips are good. Uh, if you can get a two for one, that's good. All that's true. But there's these little nuances that most drafters never even get into unless they're playing at a pro level. Where like the the card Owl Bear in Adventures of Forgotten Realm Limited, that's a five mana four four trample that cantrips when it comes into play. Banger stats banger. But what you don't know if you didn't play a lot of that format is that green four and five drops are plentiful and you can replace that easily. It might not be as good as the Owl Bear, but if there's a worse card that costs three in green in the pack you should probably take that higher because two and three drops are a premium in a format that fast and you can stabilize with whatever if we get to five mana you don't need the best five drop you can have the third or fourth best five drop but you need a two or three drop to get to that point and just that sort of thing even if you have drafted a lot in your life if you've not drafted that format you don't know that so uh, i i think that draft and limited are the highest skill and if we need a constructed format to point at high skill, I kind of like Popper for that. 